and then dr ratnakar will share the video and start we are going live in 5 4 3 2 1 we are live now yeah uh, good evening all fellows so dr adarsh will be here from our side we have all the most of the ortho uh, sunshine ortho team here uh, i am sorry dr guruvar reddy sir had a last minute some important commitment and he he is uh, he is trying to join lit bit late he is uh, giving maximum efforts to join uh, in his absence we are going to play a video which was prepared by dr guruvar reddy sir almost 15 years back but this is very elaborate video which has got right from uh, planning positioning lighting uh, draping everything is there i'll just try to uh, share this video to you share the audio also when you're sharing yes sir yes sir so volume is zero in here the song yeah i i i i like it Nakar, hi sir. Can you uh, so the format is uh, do we uh, do we uh, pause the video and take questions if they have or yes sir yes sir if it? anyone has got any question uh, feel free to interrupt us and uh, just get clarified about that particular session. Okay, so, so you are monitoring the chat box. I uh, I think it will be difficult from my side sir because it's full screen my my side. रत्नाकर Yeah, which part they have questions? So, can you unmute and see if the audio is working, Ratna? Yeah, hey, it is working. It's we have we already checked, Doctor Adesh. No, but you check from your here in the live stream. No, no, in, in the, the live stream. only we check just a couple of things. Okay, fine. So, so you can start uh, the video. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is running, sir. Actually, uh, thing is that the initial part of the video is all about uh, how do you position the patient, how do you keep your sandbag. how do you keep your side bolster how do you adjust the lights how the draping is to be done couple of important landmarks and all so uh, i think that all can be uh, uh, the fellows can see that directly when we share the link right okay. now we can directly start uh, from the skin incision yeah, let's start yes. from here yeah. yeah okay so so this is about the once the draping patient is positioned some markings will be done and then we'll start with the skin incision ready to go and you have to go for the inside night now by doing incision in the flexor position we can see the cleavage is so clean and very easy one important tip here is never struggle to see the tibial tuberosity that is the tibial tuberosity here your skin incision should be 1 cm more than your tibial tuberosity because that is the area where skin necrosis can happen so there should not be any tension here it should be at the junction between the muscle and the tendon when you come to the inferior part of the incision that is the patellar tendon and your cut should be medial to the tibial tuberosity or at the most you can take a part of the cuff but never transgress more than one third of this side that is the femoral condyle you can see that is the top part of the tibia that okay. is the medial area and that is the chest yeah so this point is very important at that tibial tuberosity a uh, lot of uh, when you start off the tendency is to go near the tuberosity and not leave any cuff of tissue 
but if you do that, then your closure becomes very difficult. So as you're getting the skin incision down into that area, at least leave at least a, a centimeter of synovium or tissue beyond the tuberosity so that it, it aids in closure later. So uh, especially what happens is a lot of these knees, there's a lot of tibial rotation and the tuberosity is more lateral than you think. So sometimes when you come down, uh, you would directly go out to the tuberosity and you don't have any cup of tissue left. Uh, very common mistake. So ensure that you have some amount of tissue uh, on to the, or towards the tuberosity side so that it helps when you suture. Go on, We lost the audio. So, Hassan, you want to tell anything? Yes. Yeah, we uh, that, can't hear the video. The audio is lost. No, no. Uh, sir, in between, there is no, uh, no oh, audio. Okay. Video, sir. Right. Got you. okay, so this was a question that everybody was asking last time. How much do you actually release? So, if you can see on the lower side, if Ratnaka, you can use the pointer. So from the center where the tuberosity is, you start going medial. Uh, it's important that you stay absolutely on bone so that the cuff of tissue that you're raising is thick enough. Sometimes when you're in haste, uh, as you're releasing, you leave a lot of tissue on bone. Uh, then again, closure is a problem. So stay absolutely on bone and uh, the thickness of your cuff has to be as much as possible. So you don't compromise on that at all. And then as you keep going around, if you can imagine a, a oval shape, and if uh, this is the medial side, you at least go up till mid corona. That's what we are trying to explain. So let's see that. You can see the tight uh, structures there. Now, this will be released sequentially. So, here again, if you are horizontal, it's only for exposure. As you go vertical and keep releasing, that is when you actually have, uh, you're creating more space in your flexion or extension gap. So, remember, so everybody, all the youngsters, so as you're releasing along the tibia, it's main for exposure. But if you want to open up your flexion gap later, it's so the more vertical you go, the more release in terms of balancing. But the more horizontal you go to the tibia, it is mainly for exposure. Yes, yeah, so basically, technically speaking, this is not a medial release. So this is something that we do regularly just for exposure. Yeah, effectively, you're lifting off the uh, deep MCL. That is the... Medial triangle of the upper tibia. Unless you see this, you should not progress for the next step. If the varus deformity is so severe, we have to go further backward and release the posterior medial aspect of the tibia as well. The osteophytes here on the upper part of the tibia. This all will make a lot of difference. So you have to take them out now go right up to the periphery. Then you might even cut the collateral ligament. So always cut into the meniscus. Then you are safe. Now you got to external rotate the leg and gently bend the knee to 90 degrees. Do not struggle. If the patella is tight, then you have to do some more dissection. area. This is the femoral corner. This dirty synovium needs to be taken off. But some people feel that you should minimally violate the suprapatellar pouch. And that is the supracondylar area of the femur, which is useful for our referencing in the future. You can see all this is osteopytosis in the femur, including the patella here. First of all, we'll do osteopytectomy. So here, sir, has everted the patella. Uh, so understandably, this is uh, 
a decade old video now we only uh, sublux it and move it to the side uh, if you are somebody who wants to evert it that's absolutely fine but it needs more exposure and then uh, as you do you put a lot of tension on your patella tendon uh, so subluxing is perfectly okay, but if you want to evert, uh, you're essentially meaning you do more relief. Yeah. And uh, it's a couple of points about the suprasynovial tissue here. So it is mandatory to always remove this tissue in an inflammatory pathology because this is one of the reason for the pain in the post-operative period. And in normal osteoarthritis, some amount of the tissue has to be removed. One is because we when we size the uh, femur, so we, we want to uh, see the stylus end. Second thing is that uh, when we do the anterior cut and the posterior cut, uh, we get the grand piano sign, which is a sign of a proper external rotation onto the femur. So unless we remove this tissue, you cannot uh, clearly observe these uh, fine, uh, fine things. Now, this is the normal carpet. You can see smooth, shiny, and very soft. You can see here, this is gone, eroded. You can see the difference between here and there. So, that is the eroded medial femoral condyle, and this is the normal lateral femoral condyle. Infrapatellar fat pad, and uh, it should be taken off as much as possible uh, to increase the. <laughs> Accessibility of the uh, joint. But one yeah. important uh, caution is sometimes when you try to do this, the tendon is right beneath that. Sometimes you might cut that. So be careful. A very important knee replacement. This is uh, called a patellar retractor, uh, like a curve here. It's a simple sweat, but it uh, nicely sits to the, the later part of the tibia. Uh, that is the patella. Now I will take Again, you... Uh, common posing the lateral side, you know. Uh, most beginning uh, surgeons, beginner surgeons are worried about uh, injuring the patella tendon. So they underexpose the lateral side. So whenever you're doing that again, the problem is whenever you're trying to size the tibia or trivial preparation, all the other steps you have this tissue sitting right there and it throws you off. So it's important for you to make sure that you understand the plane between the tendon as well as the, the tissue and then expose the lateral side uh, as much as you can right away because that makes a world of difference in terms of exposure. Okay, So don't hesitate to clear up the lateral space. Go ahead, Ratnagar. Are you sure there's no audio in this part? I think he's trying, he, there is audio in this part of the video. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah, Adash, we can hear you, but I don't think so. Ratna can no audio. Yeah, Ratnakar, we couldn't hear the audio from the video in the last one minute since the oh. uh, Sawbone, Sawbone model. Is it? With, uh, it is clear yeah. here. Yeah, from the Sawbone model onwards, you couldn't hear anything. You have to go back. Yeah, further, further. Yeah, from here, we couldn't hear anything. Just play on. Just see. Yeah, well, now we can hear. The femur first or tibia first is entirely a subject. 
So the first step is to make an intramedullary hole for the instrumentation. And this is a very crucial step because this is going to dictate the further steps. If you take the knee model and see the anatomy, and that is the close-up of the intracondylar notch, and these are the anterior cruciate ligament and the post ligament. The entry hole is ideally one centimeter anterior to the cruciate ligament attachments. So it will be somewhere there, almost in the midline. Right. Now that is the anterior cruciate ligament, and that is the intracondylar or not. Sometimes this intracondylar knot will be masked with osteopite, then you have to clear that. So our first entry goal will be one centimeter anterior to this intracondylar notch or the attachment of the PCL. So somewhere there. Now this is my assistant thumb and index finger. It's like a tunnel that will show me the dimensions of the femoral cortex and he will also guide me this way that way also. Once you drill the first one millimeter, let it go freehand. Don't put any force there. Now, let me explain you each jig. This is called femoral locating. So, from now here, uh, you will be seeing instrumentation related to measured resection. In this particular video, sir had used uh, Depu PFC Sigma. The other point is the the femur entry as you, after you enter you should just let the bone guide your uh, further passage uh, if you move the uh, you lower or uh, raise your hand there's a tendency for you to go through uh, the bone and make a perforation and have a fracture uh, you might think it might not happen but if you have too much bowing or anything so as you're going in if uh, there is some uh, resistance uh, you should be careful. Uh, either you reconfirm through a um, immediate, uh, um, maybe you can uh, take an image intensifier and make sure that you're piercing through. So once you enter, you just drill slowly and then wherever is the path of least resistance, uh, the, the drill will just take that position. That's a very important for you to remember. valgus cut angle whether it is 4 degrees or 6 degrees which we have decided already preoperatively but then it will align the intramedullary rod onto the paper if you see closely here this, this is marked right and left and you can see the markings also here which will show you the valgus cut that means you can cut from 0 to uh, 11 degrees here. So this is the valgus cutting guide and femoral locating guide. This we have put it in the four on the right side. These legs should be roughly parallel to the femoral condyles. Okay. This is the distal femoral cutting guide and here there are measurements. You have to put this at the nine. That means the distal femur will be cut by 9 millimeter, which is equivalent to the implant uh, depth. Now I am inserting this distal femoral block like this and go for the pins. If you see closely, that is the normal hole in which we put the pins. This is indicated by a square around the hole. So that means if you put this marker at 9 and if you put the pins into the square and then cut into the most distal slot, then you are cutting 9 millimeters of the distal femur. For example, in the tight knees or in knees with flexion deformed knees, if you want to cut more, then what you got to do is you move these pins into another slot which is indicated by plus 2 here. You can see that is plus 2. That means you are cutting more by 2 millimeters. Now, we are ready for the distal femoral cut. When you do the cut, you should always 
try to cut both condyles in the single stroke like this. but never cut one first and one afterwards then there will be stem now this is a jig called sizer plus external rotator cutter that means in a important uh, tip last time we all discussed as to how to use the saw blade right uh that's position of the saw but what is very crucial and important is before you hit the bone the saw has to start uh the the blade is very thin right it is either 0.8 mm or 1.2 mm so if you hit the bone it will sky and then start at a different point so for the saw blade to have very good tension and it, for it to be stiff it has to start and it has to be running before you hit the bone i always see fellows they first hit the bone and then start the drill uh, that's when you will skive and then you will have a wrong cut so it's important is for you to have it uh, already on before you hit the bone and another point is uh, regarding the play which is there in the saw uh, in the all these jigs so you really need to be careful Uh, how much you are cutting so it comes with practice but in the initial stages take a cut go back look at whether you've cut at the, that particular level go and put the saw blade again see if you've reached that level so don't just think that the cut is done that's that is that would take you out of a lot of trouble in your early cases if you ensure that the cuts are complete <clears throat> if you are not sure how much you've cut always use a caliper and measure uh, if you're unsure you're cutting more or less so curve of the blade is 1 mm for example if you're cutting 9 your thickness of the cut should at least measure 8 so that means you've cut 9 mm if it's measuring 7 or 6 that means you've left bone and you'll have to recut again so that's good practice in your first 50 100 cases always keep measuring then you'll know how much you're cutting Besides the size of the femoral component, and it dials three degrees external rotation on the femur, which is very important for patella cragi and for good alignment. I will show you how we have to use this instrument. The legs of this jig should touch the posterior femoral condyles on both sides snugly. If your femoral cut is right, then this also should be snug fit to the cut. now this is a plus to the distal femoral cut surface and we will see the sizing here a very important point is you should never notch that is the anterior femoral cortex and that is our stylus this should touch the lateral most prominent part of the anterior femoral cortex otherwise if you go into the central part or medial part you will end up notching because this is the most prominent part and one practical tip here to avoid notching is is just to use a blade and put it on the anterior femoral cortex and then take it the measurement on the top then the pins you are just 2 mm on the top then by putting this blade what i am doing is i am referring the anterior femoral cortex 2 mm above so there will never be a notching now let us see the size when we put this side so i hope this point is clear about this uh, position of the stylus on the highest part of the lateral cortex of the femur stylus there on the most lateral part of the anterior femoral cortex this indicator is in between 2.5 and 3 so you got to lock this knob there without moving anything there so now the dilemma is whether we have to go for 2.5 or to go for 3 so the ideal way is to ultra size it that means you have to take 2.5 then if you move down then if you see here actual size is here again here the indicators are there so you have to move this knob on both sides to 2.5 yeah you can see that is 2.5 it is connecting on both now tighten these two knobs okay and now you are ready to fix this to the femur with the pins if you see closely here so this makes it anterior referencing 
so like how we discussed last week which part of the jig uh, the sizing guide moves decides whether uh, the instrumentation is specific for either anti referencing or post referencing so we've measured from the top and uh, as it moves up you are deciding the amount of bone that is being cut posteriorly and this is the right medial hole like that this is the left medial left lateral right okay now we are going with the right lateral and uh, that is the right medial so that means we are we are putting the hole in 3 degrees external rotation okay. that is the holes we made or going to be axis i am connecting these two holes this is the line in the posterior femoral condyles and that is the trans epigonal length which is 3 degrees external rotation to this the most important thing about this trans epigonal line is it's almost parallel to the upper part of the tibia you can see that so your flexion gaps and extension gaps all will be nice if you got parallel space between these two so this is pfc this has a fixed ex external rotation uh uh which is 3 degrees other systems have uh, the ability to rotate more or less uh but pfc doesn't uh the way for you to know whether this is the correct rotation or not is the bony landmark that we discussed last time uh, which is the white sides line uh, and the transepicondylar axis a pc anyway you don't have the clinical ability to check so based on these two you will have to decide whether you want to external rotate more or not which again is a manual step which is not recommended if you are just beginning uh, so in a pfc you have a have a fixed external rotation of 3 degrees a point to be added sir here so these uh, this particular jig which is demonstrated here has a fixed 3 uh, degrees of external rotation now the newer version of the uh, pfc sigma which is called high uh, high profile uh, instrument where you can dial 1 2 3 4 5 and you can change your external rotation yeah mind you pfc instrumentation which we are still which we are using now is was designed long time ago yeah so the further iterations that have come the high performance uh, instrumentation the instrumentation um, the footprint of the jigs the blocks everything has come down as well as the ability to rotate yeah. so has sir there is one question also how to get yeah. a pre op idea for external rotation that should be set on the jig so the amount you are externally rotating you should know the purpose of that one one is you want to stay anatomic and parallel to your tea Uh, what is the reason you would external rotate more is if you have a tight medial flexion gap that is the only reason we would do that so base that should guide you further do you want to external rotate or not how much can you rotate beyond tea you can go at least till 3 to 4 uh, degrees so that should be your guide so by now you would have already cut your tibia uh, you know your extension space flexion space to some extent and if you feel your flexion is very tight posto medially and if you are somebody who likes to do a cr where again it's a posto medial stabilizer you can tend to dial little more external rotation in your femur so these two points should guide how much rotation you want to give upper cutting device uh, whereby you can cut a cut on the anterior side and a cut on the posterior side and you can do a chamfer there and you can do a chamfer there that means you finish all the other four cuts through this once you put this uh, cutting guide you should cross check whether your external rotation is correct or not if your 3 degree external rotation is correct you will be ending up cutting more of the medial femoral condyle here than the lateral femoral condyle another important thing is if you put one blade perpendicular to the tibial axis this should make a quadrangle box here see that is the cut portion and my blade is exactly on the anterior femoral cortex it should not notch
here again another tip is uh, which side should you cut first always try cutting medial because if medial you are uh, deep then lateral definitely you will notch so start medial and see if you've cleared yourself if you're cleared then you can swing your arm and try to cut on the lateral side so if you if you directly go lateral then you might miss that one last chance of not notching so always go medial make sure you're not notching and then swing your arm to the lateral side so one one point to be added here uh, in this particular picture you can see uh, whatever the particular uh, four in one side uh, jig has been used you see once you place this much how much amount of the posterior corner are cut you are taking and uh, last time uh, there was a question suppose if we are sizing in between maybe maybe between 2.5 and 3 to which one to we should uh, choose so once you place this 2.5 if you feel you are cutting too much amount of the bone posteriorly then immediately you can upsize the four in one sizer so through the same holes you can remove this one and keep the next size so this decreases the amount of the posterior condylar cut indirectly it reduces your flexion gap and suppose in between 2.5 and 3 you are choosing 3 and uh, the posterior condylar cut is very less which means your flexion gap is tight so you can just change from 3 to 2.5 so you can get an idea to which you should go yes see that is the cut portion and my blade is exactly on the anterior femoral cortex it should not notch your cut is perfect the anterior femoral bone which your cut should look like this it is called mate horn that means it's a mountain in switzerland which looks like this here that is the thin anterior part of the medial femur and this is the thick lateral part of the uh, femur uh, now we are going for the posterior femoral cut this is a bit uh, delicate cut and you should be careful if you are too aggressive or a butcher your blade might go and hit the popper glass so always you should have two hands control posterior femoral cut is very vital sometimes if you go further inwards the popliteal fossa you will end up cutting the popliteal part let us say you can have a visual estimate of this blade how much it can go inside uh, to the uh, posterior part of the popliteal fossa probably let us say 30 mm we should go only up to 30 mm not up to 40 mm it's always safe to cut less and then go for the osteotom then all the way going and hitting the popliteal part i am going for the anterior chamfer now i am going for the posterior chamfer that is our chamfer cut and that is our posterior cut you should always go there and try to take this out so that when you do liver that out this chamfer will prevent you from the damaging the distal femur Now our femoral cuts are finished. That is the anterior cut. That is the anterior chamfer. That is the distal cut. That is the posterior chamfer, and that is the posterior cut. I have loaded the femoral component onto the femoral holder, and now let's go and see. One point of caution here is when you are sitting the femoral component, if your cuts are not right, or if your sitting is not right, you might end up doing that, putting the component like that, which is uh, a flexion attitude of the femoral component which is to be avoided by all means there is no worry of putting this in extension because the anterior cortex will prevent that so one practical tip here is when you are sitting the femur with the cement ask your assistant to hold it with the thumb and press this component to the femoral cortex then your seating will be appropriate Yeah. Now, once this femoral component is in place, you can see that there are lug holes here. These lug holes have to be drilled now, which will be anchoring the original implant. And that is the 
that is the stop drill and we are going to use this here and again another practical thing here is let this drill find its own way you don't force it then if you force it it might reposition the number of component so don't do that so just let it go that's it and again one on this side now i am going to show you how to convert this into a posterior stabilized or cruciate sacrificing humeral cuts for doing a cruciate substituting or posterior stabilizing you have to use this thing which will provide you an extra box cut now we are going to go for the box cut and here we should lateralize the implant slightly for a better better lateral tracking so i am just moving it out and make a that will be cut there so that i can see the box so the box comes there and there so that is all right okay when you do this hard shot on you have to go right up to the end and then only lift it up now that is the trial implant with the box and that is the posterior stabilizing knee in addition to the cruciate retaining it has got a box you can see that and that is the profile of uh, uh, cruciate retaining and posterior stabilizing knees the cruciate retaining knee does not have any box and it has got a groove there whereas this has got a box and now i am trying this on the trial femur if our cuts are good it should go well with the punch hand but it has to sit nicely this is a homeman's type of instrument you got to put it right at the back of the tibia and deliver this tibia right into the wound the central point of this should always be medial to the tibial tuberosity that is the tibial tuberosity so it should be medial to that this rod should be in the first web space this rod should be parallel to the anterior sheen of the tibia that is a stylus there are marks here from 0 to 10 if you are taking the medial tibial corner as a reference always put this mark on 2 that means you are cutting 2 mm more than the wall on surface if you are taking the lateral from the lateral tibial corner as the reference point you put it as 10 that means you are cutting 10 mm out of the tibia irrespective of this uh, worn out medial tibial corner now we are going to take 2 mm on the top of the affected side we can take 2 mm from the affected side or 10 mm from the unaffected side okay, that is the most affected part of the tibia we can take the help of the c blade also here and put it there and you will know how much you are cutting now we can see that is the medial tibial plateau and that is the lateral tibial plateau and here is the patellar tendon so you cannot keep on cutting this way then you will cut the uh, patellar tendon so one way out is go for the medial tibial plateau first and turn your saw this way come from medial to lateral side then you can avoid the patellar tendon that is the patellar tendon now here we should use the two osteotomes it is called straight osteotome technique if you use one and lever it out like that it will dig into the tibial plateau which is a bit cancellous so what you got to do you put one tibia one osteotome and put another one on the top of it and then lift it up that is a properly cut tibial top and you can see the thickness here there is a unaffected lateral side and you can see the thickness hardly anything here that is the affected medial side now for your convenience i am um, showing the top of the tibial surface and that is the anterior part of the tibia and i put this i put this pin on the medial one third of the tibial tuberosity 
to see the alignment. And this is going to be a very crucial step for our tibial base plate placement. This is the tibial trial base plate. Whatever you do, this should never be outside the tibial tuberosity. That one is the tibial tuberosity pin. And this one should never be outside the tubal tuberosity. That is the outside. So let us say that is the exactly central in relation to the tubal tuberosity. And that is slightly internal, rotated. So always the tibial base plate should be slightly internal rotated in relation to the um, this tibial tuberosity. Sometimes or most of the time, the tendency will be to keep this like that in external rotation because the base plate nicely sits on the tibia, but always resistor. Don't worry about the coverage. Always take one single reference point that is the tibial tuberosity point. So then if this position slightly will have a bit of uncovering of the tibia, let it be, don't worry at all. But always see to that, that it is slightly medial to the medial third of the tibial tuberosity. That is our- There was tuberosity. some mix up in the nomenclature there. Uh, if you are externally rotated beyond, if you're beyond the uh, Akagi line, which is the medial border, you're externally rotated. Uh, if you're inside, if you if you're turned in, then you're internally rotated. So there, the uh, idea is to stay externally rotated. If you are uh, tibia is internally rotated, you'll have a issue with with tracking, with range of motion, and things like that. So that's uh, the first point. Any questions in the chat box, No, sir. Okay. The other point is the okay. cuts that okay. servers describing are the standard cuts, the 8 mm and 2 mm. Uh, but this is a very, uh, uh, I would say, pathology based issue. If you have a lot of lateral laxity uh, or uh, your um, deformity is very high medially, I mean, the, the severity, then uh, you might want to cut less bone. If you have a lot of hyperextension, again, you want, might want to cut less bone. So standard cuts is what the instrumentation dictates. But based on the pathology, you will have to uh, uh, decide whether you want to cut more bone or less bone. Usually, the decision is to cut less and how less. So from eight, maybe you want to cut six and then make sure that uh, your gaps are okay. Otherwise, you can always go back and take an extra cut. So always try to be a little conservative in terms of the amount of bone you're removing because you can always go back and cut more. But if you already take more bone and you perpetuate lateral laxity, then it's very difficult to come back. Dr. Jetji Singh, I Did think you raised question? your hand. Any questions? Yes, sir. Actually, I want to... It's about the positioning of the tibial component. Yesterday we discussed that the tibial component is according to the anterior posterior diameter of the lateral condyle. And we will take the reference of lateral condyle and the tibial tuberosity. So according to both, it should be internally rotated or slightly externally rotated. I am a little confused about that. So uh, if you normally look at Mm, the anatomic planes, if you're turning in, it's internally rotated. So yeah. the correct nomenclature is you have to be externally rotated beyond the medial uh, border of the tuberosity. Medial border, okay. Yes. And uh, actually Thank last you. time, what we were discussing, the sizing of the TBI is based on the anterior posterior dimension on the lateral Side. Lateral side. It's not about yeah. the position, it's about the sizing of the tibia. When okay. it comes to okay. the position of the tibia, it is about your Akagi's line. What Dr. Suhasar is telling, take your middle third of the tibial tuberosity as a reference and then posi uh, position the tibial tray. Oh, got it. Got it. between two things. AP yes, dimension yes. of tibia is for sizing and Akagi's line is for the positioning. Okay, the thank you. Got it. Ro rotation. Rotation. And, uh, 
and the reason we use lateral is because lateral is constant there is no expendable bone or anything that's happening so you size it on the lateral medial if you have more bone or you have to do a reduction osteotomy uh, you can change sizes uh, that's why because the lateral side is constant and it is smaller so you use that as a reference and then whatever is going on medially based on the situation of surgery you decide what needs to be done so rotation is based on three things like how we said last time one is the akagi line two is uh, floating method where once you trial you flex extend the knee uh, successively three to four times where you're letting the the tibia and femur uh, decide how they want to sit and the third is uh, you can align it to the lateral border of uh, the anterior aspect of uh, the tibia these are the three uh landmarks that are used to rotate and again uh one is not better than the other and always it's a confluence of all the three methods uh for you to decide your correct external rotation if you want to err err more on the side of rotating it externally sir uh, i have one question Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Sir, sir I have got one question. Uh suppose uh considering the femoral uh, component, uh usually uh, the uh, femoral with the femoral component the tibial component uh, uh match with the one uh, two sides up to two sides down. Uh suppose uh compared to the femoral component uh after taking two sides down also i have a little bit of overhang so uh, anterior overhang is not acceptable as i know uh, is there uh, if the overhang is uh, uh, acceptable in posterior side so the the femorotibial uh, mismatch or what is based on what instrumentation and what implant you are using if you do smith and nephew then it's plus 2 minus 2 but if you're doing depth you it's plus 1 minus 1 so that is important for you to remember while you're cutting your femur and your tibia okay uh if you have already prepared uh, a particular size on your femoral side you should always have in your mind so the first thing you should do is after you take your tibial cut size it right away then you know the size of your tibia Uh, and you also know how much bone you have more or less right then when you're doing the femur you make sure you're using a compatible femur on the on the femoral side you can play around so, a bit a little bit over there yeah that's what he yeah. said so uh, the and it is individually based on what company are using number one uh, once you know the size of the tibia you decide about the size of your femur and there was a second part in your question what was i that? think he wanted to know if at all we need to overhang which side we should side is it safe yeah, so medial or the it lateral it all depends on uh, yeah the two structures that we worried about is the popliteus postero uh, lateral uh, lateral postero lateral and the uh, mcl which is anteromedial so these are the two structures that can rub against your tibial base plate so if you if you ha have any overhang don't accept anything posterolateral and anteromedial anterolateral they sometimes they can be overhang that is acceptable and any overhang posteromedial is acceptable the way to remember is what soft tissues uh, can impinge so you should not have the mcl impinging or the popliteus so no posterolateral or anteromedial overhang is acceptable okay sir thank you sir okay one third of the tibial tuberosity sometimes we tend to put uh, too much into internal rotation because the tibial base plate sits nicely on the tibia but you should rest is that the only reference point for putting this here is exactly medial to the tibial tuberosity full stop this is an extra reference point this rod should go and touch the first web space you can see here here that is the first web space so here he is shown uh, two out of the three uh, two out of the four methods that we we discussed the other day about uh, tibial tear rotation one is the 
uh, uh, matching the tibial tuberosity that is going parallel to the Kagi's line. The second is the, using the drop rod to make sure it's matching the second uh, web space. <clears throat> the third, as Dr. Sahasar is mentioning, was the free floating technique. And the fourth is the anatomical method where you match the medial, the shape of the uh, anatomy of the tibial, base, uh, tibial uh, plateau. <clears throat> Four methods. Uh, yeah, but this is all osteoporosis, and uh, we have to level them out. At the same time, sometimes there may be a bit of uh, uh, posterior overhang of the implant here, but don't bother. The most important thing is you should always be medial to the tibial tuberosity. Now we have applied the um, tibial trial and poly and the femur. The poly is 10 millimeter and this is a post stabilized. You can see this cap and the post mechanism. The trial implants are in and there are three criteria to see whether our knee replacement is right or not. Number one is in extension, there should be a relative two to three degrees of rock. Otherwise it should be stable like that. And it should not open like that, that much. When you go from extension to flexion, the tracking of the femur on the tibia should be uniform. Suppose if your medial side is tight, that means on this side, if it is tight, then what happens is it will be opened on this side. You can see like that, and the tracking will be like that. On this side, like that. Suppose if your lateral side is tight on this side, then what happens is it will open on the lateral side like this. So it should never happen like that. If you got a knee like this when you are flexing, that means your lateral compartment is tight and you have to do a lot of soft tissue release. So ultimately, when you flex it, the tracking should be uniform like that. You should not be like that and you should not be like that. Right. This condyles should nicely touch the femoral condyles. Okay. And this cut is perpendicular to the vertical axis, yeah. right? And now I'm doing the rock. Okay. Now in extension, I'm doing the rocking there. It looks rock solid. At the most, there can be two degrees of uh, movement there, but it looks solid. Stable. Yeah. It's quite stable there. Okay, that is criteria one. When I flex the knee... Uh, guys, sorry to interrupt. So, sir is telling this criteria one, two, three. Uh, imagine this video was already shooted uh, 17 years ago. So, that was a time where uh, very, very less number of people knew something about orthoplasty. Now, we have 10 commandments. Uh, this will be again explained by the master uh, in the next session. It should uh, track nicely on both sides. When I do the flexion, you can see this condyle should Absolutely. lift off equally as this condyle. There should not be any lift off unevenly. Right. Now we can see, now I have kept this knee in 19 days. This and this translation is exactly equal. There is no undue tension on this side or that side. That means the ligament balance is perfect. That is the patella. I'm putting the patella there and I'm not holding any thumb or anything there. And now we have to see. Yeah, you can see that patella is slightly going out. So I will do a slight lateral release here. I will show you okay. the steps of patella plus. So anyone has any question? No, no. Yeah. Sir, I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, sir, uh, while checking this patella tracking, sometimes uh, it happened uh, with a uh, deputy instrument uh, twice with me that uh, this patella is going slightly out. If I place one thumb, it's a, and uh, when I sutured, uh, repaired the medial side, then the tracking was not. So, uh, is it uh, normal or some? Uh, I had done, uh, done some check while. Uh, setting the rotation uh, uh, femoral cut. 
Yeah, Dr. Abhijit, we will be having this one session completely on this patella ones about the patella femoral complications as well as how do you prepare the patella. Uh, whenever you see this exactly the question like when there is a lateral shift of the patella when you try to uh, move uh, from flexion to extension, uh, what steps do you need to uh, do? Uh, like when to go for lateral release, when to debulk your patella. So all this uh, we will deal in one class. Okay, sir. Yeah, short answer to your question is uh, those are the two reasons. Okay. Basically, a circumcision of the patella. Now the patella is uh, round. We have done the all osteopods and circumcised. And in fact, patella is uh, very well preserved in, the, in this case. Now I will do a bit of lateral release. The lateral release should be done by inverting the patella like that. And then just one centimeter away from there. Sucks. Is very well preserved in this case. Now I will do a bit of lateral release. The lateral release should be done by inverting the patella like that, and then just one centimeter away from there. Make that cut and. Now you can see the change. You can yes. see that is nicely sliding in the intercordial or notch. No inversion. Sir, I'll pause this video here, sir, because uh, the further steps are very old videos. Uh, the cementing technique and all, which have very lot of recent advancements in that one. So we'll try to show the new videos in that. I think there's a question about uh, poly lift off. Yeah. So usually you find it uh, in a CR based uh, knee where you have a tight PCL. So uh, the issue is not medial or lateral tightness. Uh, the issue is uh, the rollback of uh, the femur over the tibia. So if you have a lift off, that means your PCL is tight. Uh, and then you have to start pie crusting the PCL. You can do it both with a large bone needle or uh, use a cautery to take it off the roof of the femur, whichever is more uh, convenient or comfortable for you. And then as you're releasing, yeah, you can see that uh, the the rollback starts decreasing and the femur and the tibia nicely goes and uh, sits underneath the femur instead of where the femur is so back or over the tibia, then they come back and sit. So if you have a lift off, it is the PCL is the reason, and the answer is to pie crust. And if you start pie crusting and you feel you've done more than what is required, then you convert your CR poly into a CS poly. So Dr. Dilpit wants to know tricks while using all poly or fixed metal back poly. Which one to which one is better? <clears throat> Um, uh, overwhelmingly, metal back has done better. All poly still can be used, but your bone stock has to be very good. Uh, the problem with all poly is when you're trialing, you'll have to be absolutely sure. You can't uh, uh, say I'll decide whether to use a 9 or 11 poly later because it all comes as one mono block. So only then you can open uh, the tibial company and cement. So one uh, uh, important factor when you're doing an all poly is uh, make sure you know the uh, your, your trials and your thickness of the poly is already locked uh, because you cannot if you have uh, instability later after you cannot change but in a metal bag you can uh, put your femur cement your femur cement your tibia and still use a trial and then decide on uh, the poly thickness later uh, that is one thing you cannot do with uh, an all poly tibia
and usually indicated in uh, patients who have good bone stock. Sir, if there is a malposition of tibia base plate noted after tibial preparation, is it possible to change its rotation again? Uh, it's easier to uh, decide the rotation in the first go. But sometimes if you realize that you have not put it in the right uh, position, you can again pin your tibia into the right uh, rotation and then re-prepare the key. But the only problem is you're just talking about few degrees, right? Even if you rotate it by 10, uh, it's very difficult that you will create a new plane, a uh, new axis. So what eventually happens is your keel will become, uh, the keel will be quite broad. Uh, the point that you have to notice when you're actually cementing, make sure that you're externally rotating it into the new position. But if you, if you create a good axis, means a separate axis, and it's not just widening of the keel, then you can put it in the new uh, keel position and then you can cement. Dr. Ajay, uh, his question is intraoperatively changes of CR to PS need uh, will not affect extension and flexion gap balancing. So Dr. Ajay, uh, whenever you switch over from CR to PS, definitely your flexion gap will change, especially the posterior medial gaps will open up. So the gaps won't be same. They will change. So we will have to change that extension gap again accordingly. Yes. yes. How can we change uh, that extension gap after four in one cut? How can we change it? Yeah, uh, we can we can revise your distal femur cut even after four in one cut. So uh, one thing is that suppose if you have any uh, landmarks of the previous pins, you can use that as a reference. Or what you do is you take your distal femur cutting jig, you take the saw bone, uh, uh, saw blade and try to flush through the distal femur cut and try to reattach, uh, uh, fix your uh, distal femur cutting jig once again with the new, uh, with the pins again. And you can do plus two or plus four depending upon uh, amount of uh, uh, extension gap more you want to open up. So technically speaking, technically speaking, you don't, uh, Kishore, can you mute yourself, please? Yeah, technically speaking, uh, you only have to revise, of course, of course, your distal cut, then your chamfers have to be revised, but your anterior and posterior usually don't change because obviously you've not taken anything in that plane. So as uh, Dr. Ratnakar said, put a blade on the distal surface, see how much more you need to cut, change the jig accordingly, take the distal cut, and then reapply your four-in-one jig and take your chamfers. You can do it. It can be changed. Yeah, it's two extra steps, but yes. uh, they're necessary. Yeah, we'll take a video of this one and share in WhatsApp. Okay. okay. So next question is, uh, sir, what is joint line elevation and what affects it? Dr. Kushal, can you please answer this? Yeah, so to understand that, uh, one must know what is the joint line. The native joint line. So just imagine the place where the knee is mobile that plane of the distal femur surface, that is your joint line. So when you put a prosthesis in place, the end of the distal femur, which articulates with the polyethylene, that is your joint line. So if you compare the joint line level of your prosthesis to your native joint line, and there is a increase of or a joint line elevation, which means that line has gone proximal by either 0.5 centimeters or more then that is a joint line elevation. I mean, anything more than normal is elevation, but the one that is significant is more than 0.5. So your question is what affects it? So as we know, it's the distal femur cut, which is the primary thing affecting the joint line level. So if you cut your distal femur, or if you have an excessive distal femur cut, that means you're elevating your joint line. You've cut more and your prosthesis is going to go and sit higher up. So your joint line gets elevated. So your patellofemoral uh, mechanics get disturbed. Uh, yeah. Second thing that happens is uh, you will develop mid flexion instability. These are the two main issues. So the threshold that we have is uh, you don't elevate it more than three millimeters. Anything beyond three millimeters, 
uh, studies have shown that uh, you start having uh, poor results. Uh, because we always talk about removing little more bone, like for, for FFDs or for flexion extension mismatch. So the liberty that you have is up to three millimeters. In worse bones, where you have to take more, you do take more. Uh, if Dr. Gurvarati was here, he would contest what we are saying. Uh, he doesn't feel joint line affects, uh, the effect is that significant. So if your surgery uh, or your extension gap needs more space, uh, you can go a little more. Uh, though the joint line changes, uh, sir, with his vast experience, has uh, time and again said that it doesn't actually affect uh, uh, patient reported outcomes as much as uh, we make it out to be. So if it's needed, you can go more. But if you purely want to base it on uh, evidence and literature, it is up to three millimeters. Yeah. What is the meaning of mid flexion instability? How to address it? So the best way is to avoid it. So this is extension. This is flexion, right? In extension, your ligaments are tight. In your flexion, the ligaments are tight. Okay. As you go from extent, extension to flexion, there is a point where the ligaments are lax. And uh, it is only the confluence between your femoral and tibial component, which actually give you the stability. If that is not there, you have mid flexion instability. Okay. Once you have it, it is very difficult to treat it. Uh, and actually, whether it is significantly affecting the patient's gait or not, it is uh, very difficult to predict. The main issue they have is, uh, especially when they go are going downstairs, right? So they are not in extension, they are not in flexion. They are in that 45 degrees of angle. That is where... Uh, if your tibiofemoral contact is not good and there is some laxity, uh, they will have issues. Okay. If you want to solve this problem, you'll have to make the knee tighter, either in flexion or extension. Okay. So it is always a compromise once you have that problem. But do you have the problem or not? It is very difficult for you to do or assess in trialing. Usually it is the medial side uh, which we are more worried about. Lateral can open a little more, like how we discussed last time. So, uh, causes, I can just see questions keep coming up. So, the causes is uh, you haven't uh, balanced your gaps well. The other reason uh, for this mid-flexion instability, they say, is the MCL uh, insufficiency elevation of joint line. And certain yes. papers say <laughs> about the implant design where the multi-radius and the single radius of curvature they speak about. So usually they say that single radius curvature will solve the problem of mid-flexion instability. But uh, in reality, I don't really see uh, that much difference is there or not. Provided you cut the same amount of distal femur and posterior femur. Yeah. That's the only time your single radius design actually works. Once you are taking differential amount of bone for your flexion and extension gap from the femur, then the single radius design doesn't uh, work anymore. Yeah, and obviously the reason why it's called mid-flexion is because it's stable in extension, stable in 90-degree flexion. But as Dr. Suhas said, it's those middle ranges, 30 to 60, and that is when it's unstable. Any modifications in surgical techniques when doing all poly implant other than sizing? Yeah, the okay. one that I told you is uh, uh, about the thickness of the poly. You'll have to be absolutely sure uh, in terms of uh, the thickness of the poly. I'm not sure if uh, the other faculty want to add anything to that. Any advice to ensure good post-op flexion to have a good femorotibial rollback mechanism? So if, uh, if you want to go really into the nitty gritty, uh, some surgeons leave their flexion gap slightly loose as compared to extension gap, precisely for this reason. Uh, they want uh, the flexion to be little more, okay? Uh, inadvertently, if you're seeing post-operative, your patients are bending more than what they normally do, you've left them uh, looser in flexion. So, it's a very uh, tight rope to walk. 
Um, so I would just advise if you're starting off, keep your flexion extension uh, uh, the same. Uh, but as you refine your technique and you're more comfortable with your in, uh, your instrumentation, you can slightly keep your flexion a little loose. Uh, this is all PS design. The CR design is where the flexion and the rollback is designed, uh, is uh, decided by the tension in the PCL. So okay. if you have too much tension, then you won't have rollback and you won't have flexion. So you'll have to keep eye crusting your PCL to a point where you think the rollback is optimum and then you have good flexion. And one very important point is the restoration of your posterior offset. So in anti-referencing systems, if you undersize the femur and your posterior offset is not restored, then that leads to a loss of that terminal flexion because there's no proper rollback. The lever arm gets reduced. So the patient will have a difficulty in deep flexion. Just so to one comment from... Oh. One comment yes, from my side. Uh, previously, regarding this high flexion was a big uh, marketing thing. Uh, there are certain, in, in the same DPU, they are giving CR150 and PS150, where they are claiming more flexion when compared to ordinary or straightforward uh, process. But here, as Dr. Kushal told, we have to remove the posterior after getting posterior condyle cut. Again, we have to remove further cut so that posterior offset will be increased. That particular uh, PS uh, or CR150 will have further increase in the width so that we will get more flexion. So it's... we have done certain of that CR150 and good results, but of late that is being removed and we are now getting only straightforward uh, processes. I don't think anything extra. Only one thing we have to keep it in mind is uh, you have to tell the patient whatever moment in flexion is getting, you may get further 10 to 15 or 20 degrees maximum, but not more than that. The initial preoperative flexion will get 15 to 20 degrees more. That is very important. That much we have to after rehabilitation. This is what Dr. Vivian was saying. So this yes. is a this is a high flex design where you're cutting more uh, of the posterior femur. And that is getting stuffed by a femoral component, which has a more radius of curvature. Theoretically speaking, uh, it will further flex and give you more flexion versus a normal cut where, so usually it's two to three mm more cut. Uh, but clinically speaking, uh, not a single study has shown that uh, you have more flexion with high flex knees versus normal. Next question is, what exactly do you notice after notching the femur and how to bail out? So actually notching has got different grades. Uh, if at all it is a grade one or two, grade two, where you just uh, notch the anterior cortex of the femur, we really need not worry about that one. Suppose if you notch completely the whole of the anterior cortex, that is an area where we need to be worried because which uh, this increases the possibilities of supracondylar fractures post -oply. And uh, I don't think so. It is uh, that common that you completely take off the anterior cortex. And only way to bail out is just to uh, use an extension rod uh, so that you can bypass some forces there. Anything else, Soha, sir? Yeah, so you have the outer table, you have the marrow and the inner table. So it's one, two, three grades. Uh, two ways of notching. One is when you actually use the saw blade and you haven't sized your femur properly, and then you notch. Uh, the second reason of notching, and sometimes you miss it, is uh, if, if you have a very tight flexion space and you're trying to cement a femur, sometimes instead of flexing, the femur extends. And if you have, say, a grade one notching already, meaning the, the weak, the bone is weak on top, uh, the femur extends. And then as you bang in, the tip of the flange can actually go through the, the medullary and then go into the inner table. So this also can happen. Two things, uh, make sure you're flex. So this you will know when you're trialing. So if when you're trialing, if you see the femur is extending and going into the bone, you have to revise and make sure your gap opens up. The second point is what Ratnaka was saying. 
recognizing that you've notched, notched is very important. Once you've notched, uh, that area will be a stress. Uh, if you have a stress riser, it will fracture through that area. You have to convert to a PS with a stem extension and bypass that area. So remember, even trialing, if your femur is extending uh, and, and you, during your final implantation, there is every chance that you will watch that femur if the bone quality is not good. How to, uh, what is your advice in correction of flexion deformity during TCAR? We have a session for this doctor, uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar, a session for recurvatum and flexion deformity separately. We can discuss this in detail at that stage. Deep dish or mobile inserts have any benefit in early phase of surgeries? So deep dish is different, mobile bearing is different. Anybody wants to take that? Or? I think uh, deep dish is definitely a very good uh, advantage, especially when you are doing a CR type of uh, thing. Though it is a biomechanical, it is told uh, when you are using CR, don't use a curved stem. That is the beautiful book is given in the install. But still in, in our practice, when you are doubtful about uh, posterior cruciate ligament integrity, if it is partially damaged, something like that. So better on a safe side, just like a seat belt, better to use a curved plus, that means deep dish. So deep dish has role when you are suspecting some integrity of the PCL. In the event of PCL completely loses, also deep dish will help. But this deep dish also, there are different companies are giving different types. Previously, we are having NK2 type and uh, link where they are absolutely ultra congruent inserts. They are very good and uh, usually they will give a lot of uh, uh, congruity and a lot of uh, bad, um, stability for the joint. But in DPU, which we are com doing commonly, deep dish is definitely a tool where we can compensate for the deficiencies of the PCL. That we have to keep it in mind. During surgery, we have to be careful about assessment of the PCL. Uh, that is very important diagram where we can, uh, I think, Swas is going to discuss. Yeah, so this, uh, I'm not very good at drawing, but I'm doing my best. So this is a mobile bearing. In a mobile bearing, it's the femur that decides the size of the polyethylene. Uh, so you don't go by TBI, meaning if TBI is three and femur is two, you take a two uh, polyethylene because it's highly conforming. Okay. Versus a deep dish uh, is where if this is the anterior, you have an anterior lip. The posterior is normal. So this is the difference. So deep dish, as I said, is used where you've pie-crusted your PCL and you realize that maybe you've done more than what's required and you need an anterior stop. Okay, so that's a deep dish versus a mobile bearing, which is usually cruciate sacrificing. You already removed your PCL. Your whole stability is coming from the, the femur matching the polyethylene. So this is the whole concept of kinematic conflict. So this is deep, this is deep dish, and this is the sorry, this is the mobile bearing, and this is the deep dish. Yeah. Jagseer Singh asks about lateral release of patella. We'll show the video, but just quickly, there are three stages of lateral release of the patella. The stage one is where you go from the midpoint of the patella to the tibial plateau. So that's one centimeter lateral to the midpoint of the patella, go down to the tibial plateau. You should not do a through and through cut. It should be the, I mean, keep the capsule intact, do an inside out release. So we'll show that in the video. But you have to just ensure the retinaculum is cut down from the midpoint of the patella to the tibial plateau. The second is from the midpoint of the patella to the superior pole of the patella. And the third is from the superior pole of the patella to the two centimeters above from there where the superior lateral genicular artery is there. So just stop short of that. So the next question is uh, avascular necrosis. So ensure that the blood supply is not disturbed. That's the only way to um, avoid the necrosis. But the, practically, this does not happen. Uh, you will see it in your practice. You will not uh, come across that kind of a situation. Do you advise prophylactic distal femur plate fixation in case of notching? So again, notching is also something 
very rare if you do it step by step uh, ensuring with the template uh, the um, what is that capture <clears throat> c blade sorry um, that you've sized it properly and you've taken your medial cut as dr suha said first and then the lateral these things don't happen even as you notch you sometimes realize you're a little too deep so you can just kind of balance that out and make sure it doesn't happen but if it does happen uh, if you're sure that it's a complete notch then 100% you have to protect that with a, uh, a ps and stem will do the trick um, plate may not be needed the rod is enough i think plating that whole thing will be a overkill yeah so this is about that uh, lateral release so that is a patella uh, lateral border 1 cm from that you are just releasing it uh, this is going from the midpoint of the patella proximally and uh, like dr kushal was telling the other 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 thing is that if you want to extend from the midpoint of patella uh, you can come down to the tibial plateau also can you can appreciate this one yeah so this is a left knee yeah So the only caution here is if you see the cautery trip, you don't have a control as to if it's going through and through versus if it's uh, protecting the outer the capsular layer. So a better way to do it is just nick it with a knife, put your scissors through and ensure you leave, you go between the plane of the capsule and the retinaculum and then cut the retinaculum and try to maintain the capsule intact. But sometimes it's so tight you have to actually do a through and through release. How to balance between femoral component flexion and extension to avoid increase notching intraoperatively? So this was the explanation that uh, we should avoid femoral component and it extension to increase that notching. Uh -huh. So it's the other way around. It's if if you don't have a tight, if you have a tight flexion gap. That can end up in extending your femur and notching. Okay. So the idea is to not have a tight flexion gap. So if you have a tight flexion gap and you're seeing it's extending, so you either increase your slope or you release if you have a PCL on, uh, so on and so forth. So there are repeated questions about this patellar mal tracking. We have a session for that, but just for the completion purpose. So whenever you see patellar mal tracking on table, the first thing we will do is uh, you have to ensure that your components are in proper position. Means the rotations in the femur and tibia are properly done. If this is ensured, what you should do is first release your tourniquet and recheck your patellar tracking. Sometimes the effect of the uh, tourniquet can cause your patella to just move little laterally. So uh, certain times we have seen once the tourniquet is released, the things will be back into normal position. Even after that, if you feel your uh, patella is still not tracking properly, then check for any thickness of the patella, thickness and any uh, abnormal bumps on the patella. Then try to shave it off. Even after that, your patella is still mal tracking, then go for the lateral release. And uh, there was also a question about the avascular necrosis once you do lateral release. Uh, Actually, avascular necrosis of the patella is uh, not very commonly seen or very, very, it's a very rare entity. Uh, alone lateral release uh, will not cause avascular necrosis because patella has got rich uh, blood supply, even from the fat pad and different source of uh, vascularity it has got. So you just take off one uh, lateral retinacular release that will not uh, devascularize the patella. How to bail out if we overdo soft tissue release medially or laterally leading to laxity. <clears throat> so 
option right so uh, one bailout option is of course um, to convert from a posterior stabilized implant to a um, uh, constrained implant i mean if you see in extension that it it's an over release laterally or that means either lateral laxity or a medial uh, um, over release if it's in the range of uh, 2 to 4 millimeters that's the max to which you can go for your constrained uh, uh, implant otherwise if it's uh, loose if your release has affected uh, both flexion and extension spaces you can take your poly to a higher size and then um, that will get the uh, ligament start so that's the second way um, but if there's too much of soft tissue release if the entire medial side has been opened up even your constrained implant is not helping then the only way to go is a hinge if after cutting tibia and distal femur i can't insert minimum spacer block then should i cut tibia or femur is a question so the That's answer good. for this is uh, once you do your both the cuts you just try to flex and see how tight is your flexion also if you are really tight in both flexion and extension then easiest way is to just take off additional bone from the tibia but when you flex and see that your flexion is looking decent and only your extension is tight, then you have to take additional cut from the distal femur. Yeah, so I think he means in the earlier step, like extension gap jab bana rahe, That's I think what he means. That you first, is that first, correct? First. Yes, sir. Yeah, so Dr. Abhijit, again, uh, you can measure the cuts and if you see that... Uh, your distal cut is like you aimed for a uh, a nine mm and therefore nine two mm cartilage and seven mm bone. If it's much less than that, then you recut that part. So measure it and recut that part. But uh, at that stage, uh, um, yeah, if suppose the distal cut is proper, then you can just add two millimeters to your proximal tibia to get your minimum spacer block in. Yeah, the the only exception to this is if you have a lot of posterior osteophyte which would come later, then your gap opens up more. So if you are already finding on your X-ray that you have a large posterior osteophytes, then you cut a little less of your distal femur, even to begin with. So instead of a nine, even if you cut seven and you remove all that posterior osteophyte, it comes to nine. But so you have to check for distal femur cut, no? if extension gap is tight. In the initial stage, uh, if the extension, uh, we can't put that poly, then first we will have to recheck that distal femur cut. Yeah, so uh, you've already taken your tibia, now you've taken your distal femur, and you feel your space is tight. That's your question, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so in this case, if you have a lot of posterior osteophyte, don't worry, go ahead with your surgery. Okay. If you don't have enough posterior osteophyte uh, and you're tight, then you go ahead and take your distal femur. Do we have a femur extension in primary TKR components like Genesis 2 or Attune? Yes, we have many of the companies uh, femur extension right from Depu, Sigma to Buccal Papas. Even Genesis 2 has got uh, femur extension. Attune, I am not sure whether we have. I think most systems have. It's the question of availability. Uh, some uh, companies stock all that uh, in India, in some cities they do, some cities they don't. So the the take-home message for you is to find an implant which is versatile enough and uh, the supplier is willing to supply you every See who is the strongest, uh, who has the strongest presence in your area, who is willing to give you all these implants, all levels of constraints, and then use that implant. Next question is, what if uh, we cut more posterior condyle, would it affect the RM of the knee? So if you cut more amount of the posterior condyle, first important thing, your flexion gap will become loose. 
so there will be mismatch between your flexion and an extension gap and bail out for that you have to take additional distal femur cut and use a thicker poly or you have to use a you you have to upsize your femoral component which is not that easy to do because already you are committed the anterior posterior dimension of the femur keeps on decreasing as you go more proximally so uh, upsizing also may be difficult and other way is that you have to use augments on the posterior aspect so again the problem of using augments is that the minimum availability is 4 to 4 mm and not all the company systems uh, supply these augments or have that options of adding an augments so so uh, your once your flexion gap is loose uh, completely it will be an unstable uh, and also one more danger of cutting more posterior condyle especially in or some of the old indian designs was you may inadvertently uh, cut the medial collateral ligament or it may damage the medial collateral ligament that danger is there so we should be very careful about cutting the posterior condyle because if you are going more depth the attachment of the medial collateral ligament also may be at stake so we should be very careful in doing this once or twice in indian especially old indian designs that problem was there. what would be the reason for laxity in post operative period after 6 months which was not seen intraoperatively and immediate post op and what would be the ideal management in this scenario so that should not happen but if that happens uh, maybe uh, the surgeon has used a cr knee in a case where the pcl was partially damaged or insufficient in the first place but it doesn't happen so soon 6 months there is usually a late rupture which is seen um or the other reason is an iatrogenic uh, injury which was not identified intraop that's something that would have progressed like a medial uh, mcl injury which was not identified and slowly yeah or a, even a avulsion fracture which was not identified yeah yeah here the i think the philosophy law is all over the place a lot of surgeons like their knees very tight intraop Uh, and they, this is the exact reason they give that over a period of some time, uh, the knees start becoming lax, uh, and they want uh, them to be really tight even to begin with, so that when the laxity sets in, they are they are okay with it. Some surgeons want some play medially laterally as well as AP right on table, so there is no right or wrong answer because soft tissue tensile strength of the soft tissue of every patient changes. and uh, what laxity or what tightness is a patient comfortable with we still don't know the answer uh so i would suggest you rather be slightly on the tighter side to begin with uh, because you have a stable knee uh, and then maybe i do believe maybe the knee do lax over a period of time maybe in the first 6 months it can happen so have your knee slightly tighter to begin with Uh, if you if you are already lax because initially what happens is first one month lot of swelling so you won't understand whether you left your knees loose or tight so the best way to know it is on table uh, and after that uh, with sequential uh, whenever the patients follow up and all you understand and sometimes even if they are lax they are not clinically significant and patients are comfortable so even that is acceptable so it's all about uh, uh, what you think uh, is uh, which philosophy you want to follow if you ask me i would leave them slightly tighter to begin yeah, no, uh, when we talk about balancing the knee is there any particular step that helps us determine both the flexion and extension gap balancing in one step no the answer is no not in one step you have to go step by step what so you need to balance one gap first like if you're um <clears throat> if you're choosing the gap balancing method you will first establish your flexion gap and then go on to your extension gap in uh, buccal papa's knee if you're doing a um a measured dissection workflow then it's you can do it either way but extension gap balancing first and flexion later is uh, traditionally taught one step to get both is not there um, yeah the question should be which cut determines both gaps which is the tibial cut 
So if you want to affect change on in both sides simultaneously, you have to work on the TBR. Yeah. Is it acceptable work... if I leave? Uh-huh. Sorry, sorry. Sir, so sir, carry on. That's okay, go ahead. Is it acceptable if I leave some degree of FFD? So if it is an inflammatory pathology, you can, yes, leave some amount of flexion deformity because it will get corrected after the muscle spasm is uh, uh, released. But if it is an osteoarthritis, uh, we, we cannot accept leaving the joint in any amount of flexion deformity. The best yardstick to measure this is CO patients pre-op, CO patients after anesthesia. Whatever degree of change has happened, that is because of the hamstring tightness, which can reappear after your anesthesia wears out. So a knees which look extended might look flexed because of the hamstring tightness that reappears. So for you, the key is after anesthesia, wherever the leg is in terms of your FFT or extension Mm. is where you should leave them. Because some amount of tightness can happen even after that. But whatever hamstring tightness you have can be stretched out through physiotherapy. So in non-rheumatoid patients, in regular osteoarthritis, see your patients pre-op, see your patients after anesthesia. If there is a difference, for you is to uh, you have to aim to see and get them back to what they were after anesthesia. The amount of FFT that reappears after the anesthesia wears out is hamstring tightness, which can go with stretching through physiotherapy. How much so joint line difference between the two knees is acceptable? I mean, it's not about the two knees. You When you're doing one knee, you don't really compare it to the other knee. Uh, <clears throat> but there is no acceptance of any joint line difference. The joint line has to be restored. That is our primary aim. And how do we achieve that? You know, in your measured resection workflow, you're deciding to cut 9 mm of uh, femur in the on distal cut. And then that gets replaced with equal amount of metal. So therefore, automatically your joint line is restored. So for straightforward cases, which that's what you will begin with, this is how it is. So the joint line will not change like that. But as the surgery has become more complex, then yes, for fixed flexion deformities, for gross varus with flexion, these are the cases where you'll start noticing that you'll, you'll have to play around with your joint line a bit because the distal cut has to be changed. Um, but even in such cases, we don't really compare it to the other side. We just ensure that it's in within this limit of 3 to 5 millimeters from the knee. The intention behind that question is, does it actually affect the leg length? No, it doesn't. Uh, hmm. uh, actually, uh, not uh, regarding the leg length, but suppose hmm. uh, that tumor in one uh, knee, uh, is standard 9 mm in another knee if I cut femur uh, at 11 mm hmm, will there be any uh, symptom patient will feel yeah like I said uh, it's not a comparison between right and left it is comparison of what the anatomy is and where you left the knee after surgery so if you are more than 3 mm beyond uh, evidence has shown that it does affect your uh, patellofemoral kinematics and you might have some mid-flexion instability. If your system is demanding 11 mm cut as the actual cut, then the the thickness of the distal femur is 11 mm. Okay. And it goes without saying, if you're doing one company on one side, it's always better to do the same company on the other side. Okay. So how to manage a painful, non-painful six months post-op TKR with uh, laxity and feeling of occasional instability and tendencies to fall, but with strong quadriceps power? All this tendency to fall and all, it's all because of loose flexion gap. as It has nothing to do with your quadriceps. Uh, if you have anteroposterior laxity and patient is not clinically uh, telling you anything, then you can leave those knees, give them a brace, ask them to do some exercises and all. But if you're saying it is lax and patients are falling and it is clinically uh, relevant, then you'll have to go back and revise that knee. You can't leave them. So we have done almost all the questions, sir. 
I think and we I'm can almost done with the thing. battery of my phone. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, like I think we 2%. can stop today's session. Thank you. In the next session, Dr. Kushal will be guiding us about the virus TKR. TKR in a virus needs. The 10 commandments, one is left in a video. Yeah, uh, we yeah. want that Dr. Guruaradi sir to come back and uh, play for you. Yeah. Okay. okay, sir. I think uh, most probably, can see Dr. Most probably we can see about 10 commandments. I think we can probably club that with the virus. It's not a very long one. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we, if next week, uh, uh, Kushals and uh, bosses, we can do together. Yeah. Because actually, it, it most of it is overlapping stuff. So that will be a good thing. Immediately after virus, you can go through the 10 commandments. Or other way. Okay, then start with 10. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Thank Ashok, you. any final uh, comments or? Dr. Ashok Sham is there? Until then, just quickly, if the Max Knee and Indus Knee question, Max Knee we use very routinely and we have no problems with that. So if that's an option available to you, you can take it. Indus Knee, uh, I have used very few. I have not been very comfortable because of the size of the posterior uh, medial cut. Oh, yeah, it's a big condyle. So, um, a high incidence of injuring the MCL because correct. of the amount of uh, bone that was being removed. Yes. So, I am not sure whether they have changed the design because they have come up with a gold knee. Or whether yes. they have changed the There are difference. three designs. Genune, Genius and uh, Aura. I think Genune knee is which has a uh, posterior 11 mm cut. Uh, that is uh, dangerous. There is one question about uh, one side you have used CR and other side PS knee. So will there be any difference in the functional? No, there won't be any difference in the functional outcome. We have seen such so. yeah. certain patients have think, one yeah. side CR yeah. and PS. Yeah. Can you explain again that post-op FFD talk? Like you want to know if, if there is any flexion deformity in the post-operative period, then yes, we have to avoid certain things. Uh, definitely not to use any pillow under the knee. Try to use always a bump beneath the ankle and try to key, uh, use the knee immobilizers at night time to prevent this uh, uh, recurrence of flexion deformity. And you have to really stretch the... Uh, 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 quadriceps. If I damage popliteus during surgery, what to do? If you can suture or not to suture, you can put or you can just leave it. Very difficult to suture a popliteus once you've cut it. Yeah. It does get damaged sometimes. Uh, it has happened. Uh, I think it's much more common than hitting an MCL and all that, I feel. I don't know if you guys agree with me. Uh, what happens is, yes, it does open up your lateral side a little bit. But if it happens, I think you don't worry too much about it. Usually, you can get away with much without much of an issue. It can happen, I think, when you're taking your tibial cut, when you go a little bit posterior lateral, there you better to just stop your blade and then just come out and take it out with osteotome. That way, you can avoid this. But if it does happen, I don't think you should stress too much about it. Yeah, just check your uh, laxity in flexion because it will affect your flexion space on the lateral side. So yes. just make sure that uh, it's stable. If it's stable, that's fine. Just do it. If you can put in two sutures, as Dr. Atmaka said, that's good enough. Okay, that ends the questions. Yeah. Thank you. We can stop today. We'll catch up next week on the same time. Yeah. Bye, okay. everyone. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.